Uh, our brief today for this panel is to uh, explore the ways in which uh, artificial intelligence can work for us. Uh, augmented intelligence is the phrase. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's, it's the benevolent face of artificial intelligence. But let's step back for a moment for a little bit of history. Um, John, J.C.R. Licklider, um, was a Harvard-trained psychologist, an MIT teacher, and he was the first head of the technology office uh, at the Advanced Research Projects Agency. He funded some of the basic research behind the personal computer and what became the internet. And in 1960, he wrote a classic essay, Man-Computer Symbiosis, and in it, He's, he said that the appropriate role for computing was to augment, same word, uh, human knowledge and intelligence rather than supplant it. And so for decades we've been debating this issue back and forth, always in a new context. And, it, it, and if the, the theme seems familiar, uh, the context today seems drastically different. And that's what our, our panel is going to explore today. Our first guest is an IBM fellow and manager of multimedia and vision at IBM Watson Research uh, Center. He leads IBM's research and development on visual comprehension, including its use in IBM Watson. Please welcome John R. Smith. <laughs> Next is the Arthur Zittrain, professor of bioethics and the director of the Center for Bioethics at New York University. He is also the author of Current Controversies in Bioethics, and is the Editor-in-Chief for the Journal of Moral Philosophy. Please welcome Matthew Liao. <laughs> Our next panelist is Vice President for Products and Strategy for Integrate AI, a Toronto-based startup. Her company uses artificial intelligence to help businesses improve and transform customer experiences, to make those experiences more natural, more human-like. Please welcome Catherine Hume. Also joining us is a professor at the NYU Stern School of Business and its Center for Data Science. He is the editor-in-chief of the journal Big Data, and he is also the founder of SCT Capital Management, whose machine learning software is used to make automated trading decisions in the financial markets. Please welcome Vasant Dar. <laughs> so John, let's start with you. Uh, give us your take on artificial intelligence. I mean, what you know, what is different now? And where is it, where are we, where is it heading? And give us a few examples from the, the work that IBM is doing currently since you guys have been doing this for, you know, or, you know <laughs> decades, to, it, it, however it's been defined over the years. Sure, so I'm a research scientist at, at IBM and, and by training, you know, I, uh, I'm an expert in computer vision. And, and at IBM, what this has meant is I'm teaching Watson to see. But let me take a step back a little bit um, from, from that. Uh, there was a seminal moment more recently in, in AI in, in 2011 where IBM uh, built a computer system uh, in a lot of ways uh, right at the cusp of this second push in, in, in AI that was able to participate on, on Jeopardy. Um, not only was it able to compete against uh, humans, um, it was able to defeat the world champions at, at Jeopardy. Um, so this really opened the minds of a lot of researchers and of course um, a lot of, of work has continued since then. And I think we're finding ourselves in a period of, of AI where, you know, again it seems like amazing things are, are possible. Uh, since then, since 2011, of course, you know, with Jeopardy, all of the questions were uh, basically dealing with language. So there were no images on, on Jeopardy. Um, however, since then, uh, the, the, the challenges around computer vision, where I, where I do work, uh, around language translation, around speech recognition, um, you know, many perceptual tasks, AI has been able to make really great, great advances. And I think it's put us in a position now where we can think of many different industries and uh, how we can take these capabilities, which you know, are now doing amazing things, and combine them together with human expertise to make really significant impact. Catherine, um, you've written a bit about this, but what do you, you think is the biggest misperception about artificial intelligence? 
God, I think there's all sorts of misperceptions that are out there. <laughs> um, it makes headlines to talk about the end of work. And in, in another panel, we're talking about augmented intelligence versus the machine suddenly replacing us all. And we can all just sit around for the rest of our lives and play video games and smoke pot and try to figure out what to do with ourselves. Um, so, so I think that's a misperception. Uh, I think I, my, my perspective here is coming from doing a lot of work uh, with large enterprises who are in the process of trying to adopt and make real applications uh, uh, from a lot of the theoretical research coming out of academic research units and things like computer vision. So uh, using computers and showing them pictures of a puppy or pictures of a glass of wine and without any associated metadata they can they can recognize that and they can accurately label those tasks. Um, so so I, in, in doing this work with enterprises, I've seen that this is, it's just a lot harder than one would think. It's not like you can, as in the Matrix, right? If anybody's seen the Matrix where Keanu Reeves puts the little chip in his brain and the next thing you know, he can, he's an expert karate master, right? So we have this, this impression when we think about augmented intelligence that the systems will get so smart that we can put our little chips in and then we're, we'll be fluent in German after one day of work as opposed to passing the Malcolm Gladwellian 10,000 hours in order to learn, learn some new skill. Um, but in practice, uh, it does take time, um, and it often takes a articulated, artfully articulated collaboration between men and machine in order to get going with systems. So when I'm working with large Wall Street banks or insurance companies or media companies, often I'll meet with sort of an executive layer, and uh, the impression that they have is that they can go from absolutely manual processes to complete Netflix-like automation in three or four months. And they ask us to scope out projects like this where they can just plug in a machine and, and you know, we're sort of ready to go. Um, and what I like about Stitch Fix, Stitch, Stitch Fix is, and I'll use this as a metaphor to help them understand what this might really look like. Do any of you know what it is? Yeah, I'll explain it. Um, so it's a, um, so this is a, it's an e-commerce shopping, personal shopping site. So you go in and, uh, you know, say you're a woman and you're sick and tired of shopping. So you can sign up for an account and they ask you to fill out a form that tells you some data about yourself. So, you know, your height, your weight, your size, um, some ta your, your taste in clothing. So you can go on Pinterest and, and pick out examples of, of images of clothing that you might like. And you send this off into the ether. And the next thing you know, a month later, they, you get a little box that has five items of clothing that, that, that Stitch Fix assumes and predicts might be, might be something that you'd like. So this is partially algorithmic, right? So the first pass that Stitch Fix does is to put this into some big algorithmic recommender system where it, it parses the features that you've input and then outputs recommended items. But then they pass it to a set of personal stylists who are just 1099 workers who um, go through and they curate a selection that, that will likely be of interest to the final end, end consumer of the service. So basically, they've artfully combined human intelligence to give feedback to those algorithms and then all of the data-oriented algorithmic work. And I like this as a metaphor, or I mean, literal business model as well as metaphor for enterprises that are trying to get started with these tools because if we take an example of, say, a, out automating a sales process in a large bank, there's a lot of of know-how and knowledge and subject matter expertise trapped within the heads of the current employees. And the task here is to tease out some of those insights and, and transform them into statistical patterns and systems so that there can be this give and take and always with a feedback loop to eventually, five years down the line, maybe get to the point where the scales tip to the, the systems doing more of the work than the people, but certainly not over overnight. So. So the big misperception here, I think, is the sort of inflated hyperbole around the fact that the machines are getting so smart they're going to they're gonna take over jobs tomorrow. Hassan, uh, let, let, why don't you pick up on that? Since you're in a domain, um, uh, this, you know, quant hedge fund, if you will. Sure. So um, the way I sort of look at the financial landscape is in terms of... Um, sort of high frequency trading where the machine's out at the end of the day, just very short term decisions uh, on one extreme. And on the other hand, you have a long term decision making a la Warren Buffett style, where you're looking at uh, factors that, you know, the machine really has no basis for picking up on. And that's a very human um, the management en endeavor. Team and stuff. Yes, and it's just, just much more qualitative, and there's not enough data, right? So it really boils down to um, 
does the machine have enough data? And then in the middle, you have sort of short-term trading where you might hold for days or weeks. So in the, on the left-hand side, in the high-frequency side, there's lots of examples, lots of repeated um, instances, and you can learn. The machine has a basis for learning. And that game was over a long time ago. Mm. Machines took that over from humans. Um, on the right-hand side, you have machines that really don't have a basis for making a decision. So that's an inherently human endeavor. Not that humans do particularly well at it. Uh, in fact, most humans actually underperform the market. You know, Warren Buffett and a few others being notable exceptions. Um, and then in the middle, you have sort of this intermediate space where you have enough data and the machine has a basis to learn and trade on its own. My experience is that humans really aren't capable of making too many decisions in a day, right? The, the, if, if you actually have enough data, then models of man tend to be better than man. Right? That, that's what the research generally mm -hmm. tends to show. You know, human emotions kind of get in the way. Um, and, and so, you know, when we talk about augmented intelligence, you have to ask yourself, who's augmenting who? You know, is the machine augmenting humans, which has been sort of the traditional decision support model for 50 years, and that makes a lot of sense because there are problems where you don't have enough data for the machine to actually make e to be making a decision, and so that makes a lot of sense. Uh, on the other hand, if it's machine augmenting, uh, if it's man augmenting machine, then it then I feel that it's sort of a matter of time before the machine does better because you're training it to do better, and then you should expect it to do better over time. Um, so sort of to put this all together, the way I sort of look at the world is, you know, if you imagine sort of predictability on this x-axis and cost per error on the y-axis, then problems that fall on the lower right are very amenable to automated decision making. You know, you have mm -hmm. high predictability and low cost per error, and problems to the left are difficult to automate because there's low predictability relative to cost per error. Now, interestingly, driverless cars are highly predictable, right? so you might expect those to be automated, but at the moment, the cost of mistakes is very high. So they're also very high on the y-axis, um, which is why we're reluctant to cede control of our transportation yet to the machine, because we're just not sure of the sort of edge cases or when mm -hmm. stuff goes wrong, it could go badly wrong. So I suspect that that'll happen very gradually. And isn't there another uh, kind of aspect here where there are categories of decisions. I mean, so much of this technology, which you know, we used to call data science, which is you know, data plus machine learning algorithms, we now all call AI, right? Um, it was, its, it's principal use was increasing your odds of making a sale. You know, predictive uh, product predictions, uh, uh, you know, targeted advertising, that sort of thing. Um, and, and, and that's fine for decisions where Better on average is great. I mean, one of my favorite data scientists, a woman named Claudia Perlick, and her line on this. She works, used to work for uh, uh, Watson um, and, and now works for an ad targeting firm. And, and her line is that, look, this is a great time for experimentation and marketing because what happens if my algorithm's wrong? It's, you know, it's somebody sees the wrong ad. It's not a false positive for breast cancer. But we're moving into these categories of things where better on, you're, you're affecting individuals' lives, uh, you know, medical diagnosis, hiring decisions, landing decisions, where, you know, individual, these are high stakes decisions for individual lives. And that seems to me, it's a different kind of category, isn't it? Well, so medical diagnosis in terms of falls... Tr the tr your trust point. Yeah, so it, that, that falls sort of somewhere in the middle. So let's say diabetes prediction and diagnosis falls somewhere in the middle of the spectrum. Um, and machines do reasonably well, but they still make lots of errors, right? So they still make this still significant numbers of false positives and false negatives, which can be particularly injurious if you sort of miss something. Um, and so for that reason, the, the, the way machines are really used is sort of to make that first cut and categorize people into various levels of risk that humans can then, you know, pursue uh, in a more structured kind of fashion. Uh, but it sort of comes down to that the cost per errors there are, are, are still pretty high, so you're not going to cede control of that to the machine. On the other hand, imagine that we now have genomic data available, right? The, the trouble with healthcare is that most healthy people have very few points of contact with the healthcare system, so there isn't enough data about them, right? Whereas uh, the sick people, there's lots of data about them, but it's usually too late to do much about it. So you can imagine that in the future, as you get more data about people, uh, your physician could very well be a machine as well. 
or at least the machine could play a much larger role in advising you on your health. Uh, Catherine mentioned you know, not putting chips in brains. Actually, this is some, some, an area of uh, uh, research that Matthew's uh, done a lot on, and it uh, talks about you know brain-machine interfaces, some of the primitive ones we have now, and he explores kind of the future of this. And, and in terms of what you call the control problem, mm -hmm. I believe. So elaborate on that. So I'm a philosopher and a bioethicist. So in the bioethics community, there's uh, talk of human cognitive enhancement. So one way to amplify our intelligence. So uh, it, uh, is to sort of amplify biological intelligence, to get us to become smarter biologically speaking. But there's another way, which is to do some sort of symbiosis, uh, where we begin to use computer parts, right? And our <coughs> smartphone is kind of like that. You might think that your smartphone is kind of like an extended mind, an extension of your mind. But there's more, now there's something called brain-machine interfaces, where there's something called transcranial stimulation. So you sort of put something over your head. So companies are marketing this to athletes so that they can sort of perform better. They can learn better, learn quicker. And there's actually evidence that uh, it's not quite like the matrix style of you know, being able to learn a language right away. But it turns out that you can learn things up faster. You remember things more using even transcranial stimulation, which is actually a very crude technology. And there's something else called uh, deep brain stimulation, which is much more invasive. And so uh, where basically you're inserting a thin electrode into your brain, and then you, it's connected to a battery pack. And then you sort of, you can adjust the, the, the mode, the electrical currents, and it sort of sends an electrical current to your brain. And about 100,000 people in the world today have uh, already a deep brain, uh, a DBS. And they use it for things like Parkinson's disease, uh, uh, epilepsy, et cetera, et cetera, even depression. Uh, and so, uh, but the, the interesting about, thing about DBS right now is that it's, it's an open loop system. And what that means is it's user controlled. Right, so you kind of manipulate, you sort of, you adjust the level of the electricity. But DARPA, the Defense Advanced uh, uh, Research Projects Agency, for example, is quite interested in something called a closed loop system, where the, uh, m the, the implant itself will auto monitor your mood, your brain state, and your emotional state. So say you're a soldier in the war, and all of a sudden you started to panic. It'll send, uh, it, what DARPA wants to do is sort of send some sort of automatic electrical signal to calm you down, for example, right? Um, and so it'll automatically monitor your emotions and then adjust them on your, on your behalf. And that raises all sorts of questions about whether this is going to solve the control problem because, uh, well, you know, if the machine's deciding that for you, then who's really in control, right? Who's really augmenting who, what Masan's talking about? What worries you mm. about, you know, at, at what level, because we're talking about cyborgs that, here, that's basically, right. Right? That's right? The deeper philosophical question, uh, one issue that's going to come up is, so say, so it's, it's going beyond augmentation towards integration, right? And when you have this type of integration, one issue is that is, is going to be, is this going to still be me, right? Um, so uh, in this literature, it gets a bit science fiction-y. Some people talk about uploading your mental content, taking, like copying all your mental content and uploading it to the cloud, you know, so you can kind of like her, you know, if you've seen the movie Her. Uh, and then sort of, um, um, and that's, so one issue, the, the thing about that is that when you upload the mental content into the cloud, it's not going to be you. And here's a way to think about why it's not going to be you. So imagine that you take, you make a thousand copies of that, right? And just run it in a thousand different locations. Now you're supposed to be only in one location, right? Um, and so, uh, and, and so it seems like if it's running a thousand copies, all that, all those copies cannot be you, right? But the integration part seems like uh, maybe you can kind of preserve some sort of identity if it's more, much more integrated. If some sort of, if our, um, our carbon-based uh, cells can interact with uh, isomorphic non-carbon-based cells, sort of talk to each other, if we can kind of get at that level. So a lot of people are working on this particular problem, right? Sort of getting cells, uh, bio biological cells to talk to digital cells, you know? Um, and if that can happen, then we can uh, uh, begin to acquire some sort of integration and it can still be you. John, let's bring this ba <laughs> a little back, if, you, if we might. Uh, what, what is IBM working on, healthcare or something, uh, you know, that's an example of sort of augmented intelligence that, um, that you might, that is 
either in the marketplace or in the labs, demonstrated, right, um, that can be done now that you wouldn't have thought could have been done five years ago? So, you know, there are many really good examples. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about one. You know, one is in, in, in healthcare. So, you know, today, if we think about a problem um, like skin cancer, actually millions of people around the world every year are, are affected by skin cancer. And if we look at melanoma in particular, it's actually a very deadly form of, of skin cancer where in the U.S. 10,000 people uh, die uh, each year. Um, the computer can work together with the clinician, sort of addressing the fact that people don't always make good decisions. Um, they have their own biases. Uh, they get tired. Uh, their subjectivity, you know, there's a, you know, there's a lot there. The computer is objective. And the computer, you know, that's, you know, that's a strong capability that it can bring to the clinician and point things out. So maybe, you know, maybe there's, you know, maybe there's something that they just haven't seen before. But the computer has infinite capacity to, you know, to see thousands or tens of thousands of, of cases of, of melanoma and make connections, you know, that uh, the clinician, you know, may, may miss. So it's, you know, it's really problems like that where we look at the strengths of the computer, you know, the ability to look at massive amounts of data, the ability to continuously learn, uh, the ability to be there without any delay, uh, you know, the ability to sort of, you know, interject it at, at, at the right moment. Um, but really, ultimately, it's augmentation and scaling that, that human expertise. It's not replacing uh, that doctor, for example, in the end. Yeah, this is the other, uh, the, yeah, the, the comeback on automation and destroying jobs. Can I just uh, add to that? Because I, I, I just want to pick up on that. So one of the reasons there's all of this sort of excitement about AI is that we've made a big dent in solving perception. Right? Um, and the reason that's profound is because previous generations of AI required you to curate the input into a representation that the machine could understand and then we'll run with that, right? So game playing programs in the 60s and 70s, for example, you gave them a representation of the problem, of the, of the chess board or the backgammon game or whatever. And then within the precepts of that, they did their thing and did search and all of that sort of cool stuff and, and did quite well. But you still had to tell the machine what it was working on, right? The difference now is that machines just take input directly from the environment, images, like vision. They can, they can see, they can hear, they can read. Um, and that makes a big difference because, um, you know, you've just kind of sidestepped that laborious process of curating the inputs for the machine and then having the machine do kind of the rest of it, right? Whereas now it's doing the heavy lifting right from the get-go, right from the source, uh, and sort of doing it all the way. Now, I am a little less optimistic about the future when I think of the world that way, because one of the basic fortes of human beings is our ability to deal with unstructured data. A lot of the basis of human employment is the ability to look at images, whichever way they come, look at handwriting, whichever the way it comes, uh, and then do some simple sort of logical things on top of that, right? And it, do, and it doesn't matter, by the way, whether this is blue-collar workers or white-collar workers, right? The machines don't really care. Um, the only thing that matters is, is there sufficient amou amounts of data available. Um, and I think this is what the excitement is about and the, and, and the shifts that are going to happen. You know, I was in Toronto Airport the other day. I was on a United Airlines flight that happened to be a code share with Air Canada. So I went to the kiosk, tried my passport, no go, credit card, no go, global entry, didn't work, and I said, I need a human. Um, so I go into a line that's full of humans, uh, the line's full of humans, and I was thinking, this is silly, right? All you need is a machine just watching everything, right? Image recognition technology is better, good enough, and it can just tell Air Canada how many people they need when uh, to sort of keep things flowing more freely and sort of, sort of doing things the old way where, uh, you know, where a scientist is making assumptions about Poisson arrivals and doing this heavy-duty modeling and the stuff is kind of broken at the end of the day as far as I'm concerned. Um, so that's sort of where a lot of the productivity gains I feel will accrue is from this ability to just kind of ingest the raw data 
and to be able to make intelligent decisions with it uh, automatically. Right? So that's, uh, and that's going to have a pretty profound impact. Yeah, on, I, I on agree things. with that. Like with the, so the data science community, we call it feature engineering. So the sort of standard practice practices in data science up to the past couple of years have been to have a human come in and curate which aspects of a data set are going to be most highly correlated with the outputs that you're looking for. So a standard example I'll give is if you're, you've are you got a simple model where you're trying to predict the prices of houses in a given jurisdiction, you go through and you say, well, is it going to be the square footage? Is it the location? Is it some sort of amenity? And you might note that it's the square footage that seems to be the, high, the, the, the most tightly correlated with what you're looking for, so you focus on that. And in these new uh, deep learning neural oriented systems, we that sometimes there's so many possible features that could be relevant to predict what we're looking for that we sort of remove that part from the equation and focus the engineer's activity on selecting how many layers in a network might be useful, selecting which 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 type of architecture because the the connections can be oriented in different ways will be most effective in in deriving the output that we're looking for, which has led to these breakthroughs in things like perception. Um, on you know Jeopardy is a type of problem as John mentioned earlier on is one that's a little bit like entity extraction or sort of basic equations, right? So Einstein is, the, who's the most famous scientist of the 21st century? It says Einstein, right? So it goes through Wikipedia and can pull that out, which is different from truly interpretive semantic understanding of text, which uh, is harder to encode in a set of set fast rules or human selected features and uh, ha is leading to some relatively significant breakthroughs in, in applications like automated text summarization where we can build systems that make a representation of a, of a very long piece of text as well as a, a, a mathematical representation of each sentence and then basically pick out those sentences that are most closely related to the model of the whole, which is a, a thing that has struggled, has been, a, has been a, a struggle for the research community for a long time. One thing though he, you mentioned that I want to disagree with is um, with the medical example and considering these computer systems more objective than humans. I don't think machine learning systems are objective uh, in pr because of the way that they're trained. So um, in the, there's, there's two sort of uh, camps in machine learning, supervised learning and unsupervised learning. So unsupervised learning is the, the style that we, nor when, when we normally think about machine learning and from a public perception, it's the machine's magical ability to discern <laughs> patterns in data. Um, so that exists and it's hard and it's often used for exploratory analysis of a data set to get a feel for clusters of information that have th something to do with one another so that you can then build a system. Uh, a lot of the big breakthroughs in deep learning today, most systems are supervised, which means they require a human to come in and label a set of data. So they give it the right answer, and then the learning is optimizing the pathways so that when it sees something that it doesn't know yet, it's been trained, the model has been trained well enough that it can make an accurate prediction. So that means humans are training them which means there's a lot of subjectivity baked into the systems, right? So uh, give you an example of one where this can have ethical consequences. So a good friend of mine just published a post on Medium about um, a, a set of research that was used to detect and assume criminality from it, just from someone's photo. So you had these series of photos, this was done in China, of, of men, and you had sort of the top row when they had on their white collar and they looked like nice, kind people, and the bottom row were these sort of smug faces with furrowed brows. And you look at that and you say, imagine it weren't a machine learning system, it's just you as a human. Who's the good guy and who's the bad guy? And lo and behold, you kind of, you know, it's like at first glance, you, you have this intuition. So, so the, the researchers of the paper claimed, isn't this amazing, these systems can go out and automatically identify criminals just from their faces, when in fact, <laughs> you know, basically what the AI has done is it's revealed to us our prejudices, right? Our tendencies to look at somebody and be like, yeah, that guy's scary and that guy's not. And we do this every day when we're walking down the streets, right? So basically it is, it, if we view AI there as, as a magnifying glass to illuminate our own human biases, I think that there's a powerful ethical discussion to have, but it means that it's the systems, we have to assume that, we have to recognize the systems actually aren't objective because they, they're concatenating our own human behavior. Yeah. So I think that indeed is, is a risk, and uh, certainly it's something we have to take a, uh, you know, a lot of care. Um, you know, in that particular case, you know, what was the ground truth? I think that, yeah, you know, yeah. it, that sort of comes down to, you know, a, with a lot of this training, um, if you're going to be teaching the computer, then, 
is the information that you're teaching it with correct? And, you know, in the case of skin cancer, you know, well, what can you do? You can have a gold standard around, you know, the, um, the pathology reports or, you know, there, there can, you, you can, you know, you can work hard to get information that is correct as possible when mm -hmm. you're training the, the, the computer. I think these are things that we have to strive for. I mean, I, 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 I fully agree. Uh, you know, th there was always this notion in machine learning, you know, prior to this resurgence, which was garbage in, garbage out. Mm -hmm. And I think that still applies today with deep learning and so on. You, you know, you have to take a lot of care in how you train these systems. Is there, you know, in the next five years, is there something you think is going to be achievable that you s see as, you know, or potentially uh, that's striking? And I'm thinking positive here, right? So I see more and more sort of decisions getting automated and, and humans will do something else. What they do, I don't know, right? Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of talk about, well, they won't replace us. They'll augment us. Um, I'm just not seeing yet what that will be. I, I mean, I, I accept the fact that people will do something different, right? You know, if they're dangerous jobs that humans have been doing, well, better that machines do them and the human operator does something else. Um, but I, I don't see uh, exactly how that's going to sort of liberate us to do, you know, more productive things as has been the case in the past. So I'm sort of agnostic on this whole view of, um, you know, whether, you know, like previous waves of technology, AI is no different, you know, it'll just make us more productive. Um, but I, I, I fear that it'll worsen inequality, yeah. you know, mm. that it will actually, um, uh, you know, will still require humans, but the kinds of things that we value about humans, like empathy and all of that, are not in short supply. Uh, so they're not going to be, you know, sort of well compensated kinds of jobs. Uh, so I worry that, you know, the, the balance is kind of shifting heavily in terms of capital, uh, you know, as opposed to labor. Anyone take a shot at the, the five year thing? One of the other reasons why AI is taking off right now, or one of the core reasons, is actually from hardware. So graphical processing units that were historically used for video games, they do a good job moving electrons in basically in these parallel matrices as opposed to just in a straight line like in a central processing unit. That was great for processing images and leading to all the video games, the popularity of video games, and it just so happens that the architecture is also great for the type of mathematics that's underlying the types of systems that Fashant was just describing. And it's really that combined with immense amount of data and just faster processing power is really really led to the, the quantum, no pun intended, sort of leap in the revolution recently. And there's other types of hardware advances that are occurring right now. So in this, this quantum computing world, with the, and, uh, you know, and we could have a session, they just did have a session on itself to describe this, you can, given, given the sort of entanglement properties uh, that, that exist at the atomic level, you can super, superimpose various states of a bit so that it's not just the ones and zeros that we think of in standard deterministic linear processing power, but from a probabilistic perspective, and machine learning is all about statistics and probability, you can in, use one operation to basically like sample across what could be four states if you've just got two bits and up to many, 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 two to the n levels of states, which is, which is significant, I think, for the types of operations and the types of hierarchical and complex patterns that we look for in machine learning, which could lead to potentially like even more cool perception-oriented perception activities. The second is, most of the time today, it's very computationally intensive to train these algorithms. So you make the system smart, you bake up the smarts, let's say, um, in a very large cloud computing architecture. Um, so Google and Facebook, et cetera, they're doing most of this work today centrally. But all of the big companies, Google, Apple, uh, I'd assume Facebook in some way, because if Google and Apple are doing it, Facebook is as well, they're uh, um, expending a lot of energy right now to push the training of the algorithms out onto mobile devices, which means your device will really start to know you. It will, it will, it will track your data and it will be personalized to how you write messages, what you like, what pictures you're interested in, et cetera. Um, and the caveat here is, we go, as we think about privacy, that could be super creepy if these large companies then get access to all of that data. But from what I know, they actually are making attempts to do this right, where they're using some new uh, privacy techniques called differential privacy encryption techniques, homomorphic encryption, to make sure that 
Google never actually gets access to this fundamental personal data. And if we think about edge computing, so all of our little toasters and shower heads and everything connected to the internet, today all that information has to come back to a centralized server to then make it back to your fridge to tell you what to cook next. But if that processing ex exists out on the edge, I, I think it could lead to some like startling new applications. So that's, for me, that's the sort of cool, super exciting area. I, I just want to add uh, one thing. The, the area of augmented reality is very exciting, right? So that's mm -hmm. kind of the machine yeah. learning coming together with some of the uh, processing power that Catherine was talking about. Um, I think that's a world that, you know, where augmentation will be really cool uh, and, and yeah. sort of, you know, the world seems to be heading that way because machine learning has become good enough yeah. to um, facilitate that kind of stuff. Hardware is kind of, you know, so the algorithms, the AGI that we're talking about, good enough, the hardware power is there, the speed is there, so we're sort of, yeah. Yeah, that's what I would expect to see a lot of uh, augmentation happening. Yeah, imagine kids taking a field trip to like the Great Barrier Reef and swimming around, presuming that we don't kill the earth with global warming and it still exists soon, which is another problem that we're not talking about, but like, you know, and they could, they could snorkel around and have their little glasses on and have the uh, taxonomy of the fish be identified in real time, and right, so you could, like education could be awesome yeah, cool. with, yeah. uh, with augmented reality. Yeah. You could yeah. take a walk through the park and have your botany glasses on, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, some people are actually creating, sort of doing science labs where you sort of use, you know, sort of augmented reality or virtual reality where you go in and you can so kind of cool. do sort of uh, experiments in virtual labs um, and, and things like that. But just to comment on uh, sort of this, your, your question, I think that, uh, well, I already mentioned the brain-machine interfaces and uh, it's already being used. I mean, so they, they have people sort of, uh, like one person, sort of like people who are paralyzed now. For example, they're being computer. Uh, they're being wired to computers, and they can now. Uh, they're training them to be able to move different things using their mind to type. You know, sort of things on computers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are also people implanting things into their body so that they can use it to open doors, to you know, pay to check out at counters, and and you can see that sort of. Uh, I mean, there was this guy with like an antenna on the head. And, I don't and doubt they, it. You know, so all that all that's actually being done, and there's a lot lot more integration and again and uh, you know at DARPA is really at the forefront of um, of a lot of these technologies and they're trying to get people to uh, there's something called the silent talk program where they're trying to get soldiers to be able to talk to each other using their mind they're really they're trying to do that within the next five years that was what their mandate like within five years we want a closed loop system where the machine can automatically monitor what's going on out there and be able to put that into the user, right? Like an, an intelligent autonomous nervous system That's, to the outside world. That. And these, the, the uh, augmented reality stuff is basically her as a guide to the outside world. That, that's, that's exactly which, right. Yeah, so I think uh, uh, Catherine described many of these, what I would call technology enablers. I think quantum is definitely, you know, has enormous potential. IBM is, yeah, it's a huge, it, you know, it's a huge direction for, for IBM and its impact will be enormous. I mean, just in terms of computation. And computation is important. I mean, it, it's actually one of the primary things that's driving our ability to learn more complex models and, more sophistic sophisticated um, knowledge and, 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 and so on. But one of the areas that I'm very interested in, it's an application of AI, is to creativity. And if you think about it, you know, the sort of the spectrum of, of artificial intelligence, we talked a lot about perception, uh, the ability to see and hear and, uh, you know, and speak and, 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 and so on. Uh, then at the middle, maybe we have more about knowledge and reasoning. Uh, but then where, you know, where's creativity? I think creativity is even, you know, at, at the further end of the spectrum. And I think it's even harder to answer uh, the question, you know, what is creativity uh, than it may be to answer what is in intelligence. Mm -hmm. We can sort of describe a few attributes of creativity, um, but it's hard to really know what is, you know, what is happening. And it's, it's really entirely a human endeavor uh, today. So I like to think of you know, myself as an engineer. It's, about, it's all about method. Um, but what creative people do, to me, it still seems to be magic somehow. We did a project at, at IBM in this last year around horror movies. We actually got Watson to watch hundreds of horror movies. So you know, I like to think we sent it to film school. 
I also like to think I went from you know, teaching Watson to see to teaching Watson to feel. Um, because really what we were able to encode you know, Watson to do around these horror movies was you know, not, only, you know, not just see uh, objects and scenes and people and uh, transcribe speech, but characterize the content in terms of emotion. Mm -hmm. So was a scene, uh, did it sound scary? Uh, did, you know, did a scene look happy? Or did it, you know, did it, look, uh, you know, did it look sad? You know, something like that. And through these algorithms, we were able to get Watson, uh, you know, able to make a fairly good assessment of horror movies, but also horror movie trailers. We learned the patterns uh, for making a horror trailer. Essentially, it came down to three things. The scenes in a horror movie, uh, movie trailer are either suspenseful, scary, or tender. That's it, uh, but you need, you need all three. I mean, you know, the, the contrast is there. Mm -hmm. And we were able to take that simple recipe, apply it to a brand new horror movie, and have Watson uh, do a significant part of making the, the trailer for that movie. We just needed a film editor to come in and within one day, you know, create an entire trailer for the movie. So it's a good example of taking something which is, you know, might be a three month effort for a production team, you know, down to, you know, a computer assisted task, which happened in, in a day. But I think this just scratches the surface. I think it points to, you know, a lot of potential for the computer to be an assistant, to augment the creative process, uh, to do some of the mundane work um, the computer has no problem watching every movie that was ever made, if it comes down to it, and can extract insights and, you know, can really be an aid to the creative person, certainly in filmmaking, but it goes beyond, certainly goes beyond uh, making movies. There's a cool uh, trend in the computer vision world, they call it style transfer, and this was a neat, it's, it's an, I, I find this a neat um, accidental byproduct of the research process. So. Uh, as people were trying to hone the algorithms to do the type of work that John mentioned, so com vision perceptions, uh, 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 computer vision and perception, so being able to accurately label a picture according to its content, to do that, they have to pass it through this network and it, it twists and, and turns and transforms the input image and gradually gets rid of all the noise so that it can focus on the general representation that can be affiliated with a linguistic term, cat, dog, glass of wine, as I've been using during, the, during this presentation. So as there was a group of researchers who noticed that that noise that got removed just so happened to be what we call artistic style when they put in paintings. So if you put in Van Gogh's Starry Night, and you pass it through these algorithms, it will pull out the starry nightness, and then you can impose that on your, your favorite selfie on your Facebook page, right? So this, I think this actually, there's the, the, the art critical community has different views on this. Some of people say this is kitsch, right? It's, it's ridiculous that you know, our selfies can become a Rembrandt. On the flip side, it actually is a really, it, it sort of democratizes the skill set around art. So there's an app called Picasso, and I've had some conversations with the CEO of the app who said, while the critics panned it, he had this influx of emails from people, just like you and I, who were like, oh my god, I always wanted to paint, but I just don't have time to learn it, and now I feel <laughs> like I have this, like I have this agency, and I can go, and I can make a Kadinsky, and I can make a, you know, and I can make my own Mondrian, or whatever, and, um, and the commercial applications are that, you know, you can be, I've, I've done a lot of work in startups and we've got no budget, so we can't afford $50,000 branding agencies. But it's really cool when you don't have to hire that, you can pull out this app and you can, for five cents, make a really professional, neat, stylistic website. Um, so, so it's not, you know, it's not quite creatively like we think of it, but there is the sacrosanctness of, of the, you know, of genius and art um, gets, it, it forces us to ask these big philosophical questions about what we value in society when we see that this happens. And it also leads to this whole, it, it, from, a, from, a, from an epistemological and cognitive perspective, it's teaching us and it's inspired some research on the correlations between how we see and, and uh, align language with the world that we process and then how we make art and, what's, and what qualifies as style. So I think that's just also super cool you know, consequences of this, of this moment. Well, on the, uh, let me just ask John on the creativity side, because you guys have done stuff with uh, the cooking, right, uh, mm -hmm. and other things. Where do you kind of come out on this? I mean, I, 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 the, 
you know, anybody's done any kind of real, reporting or research about artificial intelligence, I mean, you kind of come away with an incredible appreciation for what we call general human intelligence, right? And only 20 watts, you know, low power, you know, it just, and mm -hmm. it get, feeds mm -hmm. into this, you know, the AI debate, of, and particularly the brain. I mean, as yeah. again, it's just, is it an inspirational metaphor, or is it a roadmap? Computers do not work like the human brain. You know, they are not 20 watts, and, you know, and they are very fast, but they're not massively parallel. Uh, it's, it's a very different ability uh, which can have great impact, uh, certainly for data processing and making, you know, finding patterns and making predictions. Um, that's really its strength. But in terms of replacing that 20 watts of, of, of human ability that they bring, um, you know, I think we, ha we have a ways to go. Yeah, it reminds me of the famous line by uh, one of the pioneers in voice recognition who worked for IBM, um, uh, Fred Jelinek, as he explained it, you know, airplanes don't flap their wings. <laughs> you know, you yeah. can, they do it differently. Yeah. That, that's right, and, and, and I think there is, some, there is certain, you know, you said, is it a metaphor? Um, yeah, certainly there's, there's a lot to, because, you know, whatever, biological systems, you know, human uh, cognition, perception, it's, it's the best system we know. So we can learn, we can certainly learn a lot by knowing, uh, you know, knowing it better, you know, knowing how it works. It doesn't necessarily mean that's how we should build our computers. So I just want to come in on the creativity. I'm not sure if it's uh, true that machines can be more creative than we are. I mean, just to give one example, take like AlphaGo, right? So uh, when it was playing Lee So Do, uh, and it made this move, it's like the 34th move. It was like a move that nobody had ever made. Uh, you might think creativity just in terms of being able to uh, come, up with, uh, come up with solutions or sort of conceptual space that hasn't been thought of before, right? And to that extent, it does satisfy that criteria of creativity. It came up with ideas that haven't been thought of before. And I think machines are gonna be able to do that. They're gonna be able to locate uh, spaces where we haven't been to before. Um, and so, um, I, I don't know what you think about yeah, that. No, I, I, even yeah. when Kasparov played against, you know, Deep Blue in, in, in chess, it reached the point where he, you know, he felt that the computer was not playing fair, right? Yeah. Or there was really a person behind it, right? Yeah. Because of whatever move Deep Blue had made, it just didn't seem logical to him, right? Yeah. So, you know, I think there is, but in the end, what was Deep Blue? Deep Blue was a, you know, a, a massive search system. Mm -hmm. There was no intelligence there, right? You know, in, in the way we think you know, about um, uh, a lot of the problems in AI, it, it just was a brute force search problem. Um, so sometimes we might ascribe some of these qualities to it, but certainly knowing what was behind the curtain, you wouldn't say you know, Deep Blue was creative. I see. So, so can I, uh, I, I think we're talking about like two types of creativity here. I think what Matthew alluded to was sort of more in the realm of reinforcement learning. That's right. You know, yeah. I mean, Catherine mentioned supervised and unsupervised, but yeah. there's reinforcement where the reward is delayed, right? And so um, what DeepMind has been really masterful at is just sort of pushing the limits in terms of reinforcement learning, which in, in simple terms boils down to you know, you have an evaluation function, you're here, you can evaluate sort of what got you there, but then what's the remaining thing to the end of the game? And that's kind of a recursive kind of problem, and they've become really good at um, solving that problem. And so a machine may make a move, and you say, wow, that's never happened before, that's creative. But there's another aspect of creativity that sort of is, seems to be outside the realm of these kinds of algorithms, which is we just find ways to do stuff, and we can't quite describe it, um, such as just even dealing with each other, right? And machines are not good at dealing with people at the moment, right? That human-machine interface is actually quite poor. Um, they're quite stunted in that sense. Um, and a lot of the research efforts and creativity, I think, will make a dent in that arena, in just getting machines to be more, you know, uh, empathic or sort of have the kinds of mm -hmm. qualities that we so seamlessly seem to exhibit. I think the other unsaid one, which is on the flip side, so there's a film called Tim's Vermeer, and I think it's fantastic. I think it's fantastic because it 
um, for two reasons. One is it actually forces us to question our assumptions around human artistic creativity. So this is a movie about some guy, Tim. Uh, he was a designer at Pixar who has a theory about the 17th century Dutch painter uh, Vermeer um, and wants to test his theory. And his, he assumes that Vermeer used a, an optic system that had two mirrors, one that sort of just reflected the the, the world that he was trying to depict, and then the other one that sort of shot that reflection down onto a canvas. And then uh, uh, Tim uh, hypothesizes that he used something like a paint by number type system to basically use pigment until there was a color gradient between what was reflected and what he was painting. And the minute it got there, he sort of shifted on, and he just sort of goes through and in a seemingly extraordinarily uncreative way, made what were the most realistic, and I, I, I'm a huge Vermeer fan, I mean just tantalizing paintings from the 17th century that looked radically different from those of his contemporaries. So I think what I like about that is it also forces us to, it's, this is less about machine creativity and more about our assumptions of what qualifies as, as artistic creativity that has a lot of ramifications also for the, the scientific research community. So, you know, I believe that the, the myth of the, the solitary genius who sits there and solves for Ma's last theorem, you know, is not necessarily the way that, that innovation and technology progresses. This is very much a, back to her and artificial gender intelligence, right? There's, there's stuff going on collectively that we from our, from our contraption our bodies, subjective viewpoints don't often perceive, but if we could perceive, like who knows what might happen. Um, and the second cool thing about that film is that to make this happen, Tim had to reverse engineer what, what he thought would have been the original scene. So to do it, he has to learn about 17th century glasswork and textiles and woodworking, and it's kind of this engineer's paradise, right? Because within this one single project lies the world. Because he has to do all, you have to learn all these things in order to solve his problems. So I like it as, a, as something that also forces us to question our, our inherited assumptions of what qualifies as human creativity in the first place, which can be often very scientific and constraint oriented. Are you guys, you know, really worried about what you, you're doing is, you know, going to make the world a, a rougher place for more people? I think, I think IBM is very clear on this. Um, you know, we've outlined uh, the principles here for a AI around three dimensions. You know, we call it um, purpose. So, you know, that a the role is about augmentation of, um, you know, working together with humans for important industry problems. Um, trust that, you know, when we build these AI systems, we'll make it very clear uh, how those models were, were learned, uh, when a AI is being used, um, what data is behind it, um, you know, and 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 so on. And then the and then the third is skill. It actually comes back to how these systems are trained. That they that they will learn from the human experts. You know that um, it's it's it is about uh, taking all of that human expertise and trying to make uh, a a joint computer human capability that's even better that can you know help scale expertise you know can help help solve difficult industry problems so i think we're very optimistic in you know in the in the potential if we follow the, these three things don't feel compelled I mean, if, you, <laughs> if you don't but if you if you got a point a strong point of view i'd like to hear it. yeah i uh i i worry i i don't have that optimistic uh, um, a prognosis on employment. I think the world will be a very cool place. You know, it'll be uh, amazing machines, augmented reality, all kinds of stuff. You know, my wife yesterday showed me a Groupon coupon for data scientists. Uh, and said, did you expect to see this? I was like, no, that's really interesting. Um, and that kind of, you know, uh, tells you where sort of people are focusing on, but that's, you know, everyone can be a data scientist. Uh, and if machines are making lots of these decisions better than us, then we'll be doing something else. I don't know what that is. Uh, hard to say what it's going to do for employment, yeah. but like I said, I worry about inequality. Okay. I, I kind of side with the economists here. I think there's been multiple technology revolutions historically and that jobs haven't disappeared. And if you look through the history, I, I mean, I come from a sort of history philosophy background. Um, people have worried about the same things time and time again. We talked about it with, there's this film from 1957, Death Set, where um, Catherine Hepburn and Spencer, Spencer Tracy, screwball comedy, absolutely fantastic. They were all worried they were going to lose their jobs in the 60s, and it didn't happen. Um, the and, MEAC was the computer. The yeah. <laughs> I also do think, though, that the fact that white-collar jobs 
subtasks of white collar jobs like investment banking, lawyering, accounting, doctors, et cetera, um, pushes a sensitive button in today's contemporary society. So there's a lot of people in the world today who have horrible jobs or jobs they don't really want, and we don't think about them. We're worried about uh, the fancy things, and I think it, it tells us, um, actually, and some people are worried about sort of you know self-driving cars and what that's going to do to the trucking industry as well, and obviously with the manufacturing industry. Um, but um, I think that uh, the fact that you know, cognitive tasks are often hyper-specialized, which is a great candidate for narrow, uh, narrow intelligence, um, leads to some discomforts with the way in which our society is currently constructed that people are reacting to. So, so I think that there is going to be some sort of, uh, it's going to transform our society. There's going to be transition costs. So people are going to lose their jobs. And it's not so easy to retrain. People, you know, especially if you're in your 50s, et cetera, et cetera, to try to retrain to say, oh, you can take a course on data, you know, mining, et cetera. You know, it's, a, it's very hard, right? And so that's gonna, it's going to hurt a lot of people. And so I do think that we need a discussion in our society about the inequalities that are going to result. The tra you know, so in the long run, maybe, so just like, you know, uh, you know, when we transition from horse buggies to cars, right? People lost jobs, et cetera, et cetera. We need to be able to deal, uh, 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 but this, this time it's going to happen even faster, right? And so we as a society need to be able to deal with that transition and to, like, what, how do we help these people? Do we do something like universal basic income, et cetera, et cetera? But we do need to have that conversation. Otherwise, it's going to, the, the inequality is going to be hugely exacerbated, and that's going to be really bad. Yeah, and the technologists should be part of that debate. Yep. It's just, as opposed to just the public policy people and economists. Yep. So we have time for uh, some questions, if there are, and I think there are um, um, people with microphones. My main concern is how we should educate the generation that is going to be, like my son here who is 12. Which type of profession, how we should encourage them, knowing that it's going to be harder in the future. Thank I've you. written a lot about this topic in education in this age. Um, so I think, uh, you know, as we've been talking about this whole debate between artificial general and narrow intelligence, um, the, this, you know, general as a model or something that it really is not achieved yet. And there's a lot of value in our being able to do multiple things, right? So not just focusing on one single thing, but really the value of a classical liberal, art, liberal, liberal arts education, right? So really sort of learning not only one thing, but, but many things will be valuable in the future. And then the other thing, as Matthew just mentioned, skills transfer. So the, 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 the most valuable skill set that one can have today is the ability to learn, learn new things. Because as the technology keeps changing, you don't want to get stuck in, in a thing where, you know, you kind of have this one skill, and if you can't perform that skill, then you're out of a job. If you can go on a MOOC, right, so a massive online open course, and learn a new skill when you're 25, when you're 30, when you're 35, that's going to be sort of the, these are going to be the Darwinian fits for the new economy. And I don't know, there's no, the education system hasn't solved this at all. Um, you know, there's, and I hope that the technologists will be in dialogue with the education policy makers to make sure that both general, general education as well as skills transfer will be, will be focused on in the future. Another question? The thing that's really looming on the horizon that I see is the self-driving car. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of money going there and they really want to make it happen very quickly. One of the things I keep hearing is going to happen within five years. So, you know, obviously, how does this, I feel like it's going to be shoved down our throats rather than we're going to be allowed to, to arrive at some sort of organic uh, solution. So what do you guys see as, how is this going to be implemented? So maybe I can come in. So one of the things that we haven't really talked about is sort of how do we build ethics into AI? And that's sort of uh, very prominent in the case of self-driving cars. So as a philosopher, we talk about the trolley problems. So what happens when a trolley goes towards five people? You know, well, let's just do it with a self-driving car. Imagine now the car's driving, it's, and it could kill five people or it could kill you, right? It could sort of turn off to the side of the road killing you, right? What should the car do? And how should, well, how should the programmer program that into the car? And would you buy a car that will kill you, right? <laughs> Even though maybe that's the right thing to do, right? And so, and who gets to decide that? So there's a, a sort of, there's, uh, who's gonna like build in these sort of ethics into the AI? So that's sort of a huge area um, that hasn't really been uh, discussed. Well, that people are starting to discuss now. So. My take on that has to do with sort of like, 
different geographical locations are a better fit for self-driving cars. So Singapore would be great, right? So self-driving cars work the best if, it's, if we go from human to all cars, all self-drivers, all human today, all self-driving tomorrow. Because once you've got all the cars that are talking to one another with their sensors, it becomes a very static system. It loses a lot of the complexity. Bangalore is the worst place for self-driving cars. Because if you've ever been to Bangalore, it's like people are honking and driving all over the place. There's the traffic lights, right? So it would be super hard. It goes back to the, as Vashant was saying, with the like quickness with which you have to make a decision and the level of chaos in your system. So I do think like this is going to be, the technology's there. <laughs> Um, you know, and it's going to be a policy decision where certain, who knows in the states if it'll be Uber that starts because they're as aggressive as they are and they're just going to put the fleet out and God knows what will happen and, you know, and then they'll get sued and they'll pay it off and the next thing you know, everybody will have self-driving cars, right? But, um, you know, I think that it'll be a geographically specific area. There'll be somewhere that's more of a Singaporean-like state that will probably be like the early adopter. Um, and then it'll gradually shift to, I can't imagine when it'll make it to a place like India, just because of the, but I think that, so the, so the sort of, that, but the interesting point is gonna be this, this middle threshold where, you know, you've got some human drivers and some self-driving cars, and you've got these, I can't remember what they call it, but it's sort of, there's like four levels of self-driving cars from, you know, cruise control to full automation, and right now there's a lot of work on the like, when does the human intervene, who's liable, when the human intervenes, you know, and it goes into the ethics and IP, right? So it's like, is it the car maker? How do we, do we model this like a software liability problem? So I think right now the issue is really one of policy and ethics. Um, but there was another point earlier on that is also relevant for self-driving cars. We hold computers often to higher standards than human behavior. And in the self-driving car world, there's so many accidents per day that it's kind of a no-brainer that we should go to the autonomous vehicle paradigm. Even if there will be accidents, there will be fewer than there are with human drivers but it's so hard to get people to appreciate that, right? So for me, this is the sort of like the messy debate in the, in the space right now. Yeah, and it's not all math. Um, well, I think we're, uh, we're a little past time here. I want to thank the panelists and all of you for coming. <laughs>